The year is 1941, and America's about to enter the biggest war in human history, with a military that refuses to believe black men can fly combat aircraft. The Army Air Array has spent two decades insisting that African Americans lack the intelligence, courage, and reflexes for aerial combat. But Elena Roosevelt isn't buying it. After taking a flight, with Chief Civilian Instructor Charles Chief Anderson at Tuskegee Institute in April 1941, she puts pressure on her husband's administration. The result, Public Law 18 passed in January 1941, forcing the War Department to create an all-black flying unit. Whether they like it or not, they don't like it. Not one bit. The Army Air Corps picks Tuskegee, Alabama, the heart of Jim Crow territory, specifically because it's isolated, rural, and far from prying eyes. If these men are going to fail, and the brass fully expects them to fail, it'll happen quietly. Tuskegee Army Airfield opens in July 1941, with equipment, other bases, rejected. The runways are shorter. The aircraft are older. The maintenance facilities are makeshift. Everything about the setup screams sabotage, disguised as compliance. The first class of aviation cadets arrives to find instructors who've been told these students will wash out at triple the rents rate of white cadets. Captain Benjamin O. Davis Jr., West Point graduate and son of the Army's first black general, leads the charge. He's already spent four years at the military academy, where not a single white cadet spoke to him outside of official duties. Now he's facing an even more hostile test, proving that black men can master the most technologically demanding form of combat in existence. The training is deliberately brutal. White cadets at other bases get multiple chances to pass check rides. Tuskegee cadets get one. White cadets who struggle with navigation get remedial instruction. Tuskegee cadets who show weakness get eliminated. The failure rate is engineered to be catastrophic. But something unexpected happens. These men refuse to break. The first class of five pilots earns their wings on March 7, 1942. Davis, George Roberts, Benjamin O., Davis Jr., M. Ross, and Lemuel Custis. The impossible has happened, and the Army Air Corps has no choice but to continue the program. By mid-1943, enough pilots have graduated to form the 332nd Fighter Group, with four squadrons, the 99th, 100th, 300nd, 1st, and 3002nd. Each squadron uses the standard Army Air, forces structure, 16 aircraft, 25 pilots, and 200 ground crew. But nothing about these units is standard. Every mechanic, every crew chief, every supply officer is black. The Army has created a completely segregated combat group, betting that it'll collapse under its own weight once real combat begins. The FOST equipment tells you everything you need to know about their expectations. While white fighter groups receive the thick latest P-47 Thunderbolts and P-38 Lightnings, the 332nd gets hand-me-down P-40 Warhawks, the same aircraft being phased out of frontline service. These planes are slower, less maneuverable, and mechanically worn. It's vintage 1941. Technology going up against the Luftwaffe's latest fighters in 1943. The f message is clear. Perform your token missions, prove the critics right, and fade into history as a failed experiment. Colonel Davis takes command, knowing every mission will be scrutinized differently. When white pilots lose bombers, it's the fog of war. When his men lose bombers, it'll be proof that the entire race is unfit for combat. The pressure is suffocating. These aren't just fighter pilots. They're carrying the aspirations of 13 million black Americans who've been told they're inherently inferior. Every takeoff is a political statement. Every landing is a reputation of scientific racism. And the stakes are about to get infinitely higher because in June 1943, the 332nd Fighter Group is shipping out to North Africa. Real combat is coming and the entire nation is watching to see them fail. 
The 99th Fighter Squadron hit Sicilian airspace on June 2, 1943. And the reality of combat strips away every romantic notion about aerial warfare. Their first mission is escorting medium bombers to Pantelleria. And it goes smoothly enough. No enemy, contact, no losses, just nervous pilots learning what flak looks like when it's actually trying to kill you. But the honeymoon ends fast. On June 9th, the squadron encounters German Falk Wolf 1-192nds over the Mediterranean, and Lieutenant Charles Hall scores the unit's first aerial victory. It should be a celebration, but the white commanders at Ducteen Air Support Command are watching with clipboards and skepticism. The P-40 Warhawk is proving to be a death sentence in European skies. This aircraft was competitive in 1941, but by mid-1943, it's outclassed. By nearly every German fighter, the FW-190 can outclimb it by 500 feet per minute. The Masormit BF-109G outturns it at high altitude. The P-40's top speed of 360 miles per hour gets beaten by Luftwaffe fighters doing 390. You can't chase what you can't catch, and you can't escape what's faster than you. The Tuskegee pilots are flying antiques into a modern war. July 2nd, 1943. The day everything nearly falls apart. During a mission over Castel Vetrono airfield in Sicily, the 99th gets jumped by a dozen BF-109 seconds, diving out of the sun. It's a textbook ambush. Two P-40S go down in flames. Lieutenant Sherman White is killed. Lieutenant James McCullen bails out over enemy territory and becomes a prisoner of war. The remaining pilots scatter, and the mission devolves into individual survival fights rather than coordinated combat. When they limp back to base, the Phoenix Recriminations begin immediately. Colonel William Rare, commander of the 33rd Fighter Group, files a report that reads like a prosecution brief. He claims the 99th lacks aggressive spirit, shows poor formation discipline, and demonstrates inferior combat effectiveness compared to white. Squadrons. The report lands on General Hap Arnold's desk with a recommendation. Pull the 99th from combat operations and use them for coastal patrol. Basically, military busywork away from real fighting. Time magazine runs a story, questioning whether the Negro has the right temperament for aerial combat. Black newspapers fire back with editorials, but the damage is done. The experiment is being called a failure. Here's what Mumir's report doesn't mention. His white squadrons flying P-40S are getting slaughtered too. The 57th fighter group loses eight aircraft in July. The 79th Fighter Group loses six. The P-40 is obsolete, regardless of who's flying it. But when white pilots die, it's bad luck. When black pilots die, it's genetic inferiority. The statistics are being weaponized, and the 332nd Fighter Group knows they're one more bad mission away from being disbanded entirely. Colonel Davis requests an audience with General Ira. Eker, Commander of Mediterranean Allied Air Forces. It's September 1943, and Davis walks into that meeting knowing he's not just defending his squadron. He's defending the entire concept of integrated combat forces. He brings mission reports, loss comparisons, and aircraft performance data. The 99th has flown 500 sorties with a loss rate of 3.8%. White squadrons flying P-40S have loss rates between 3.5 and 4.2 percent. Statistically, his men are performing identically to everyone else, cursed with outdated aircraft. Eker doesn't promote Davis on the spot, but he doesn't ground the 99th either. Instead, he does something unexpected. He starts the paperwork to bring the entire 332nd fighter group to Italy and equip them with modern aircraft. It's not charity. By late 1943, the strategic bombing campaign is hemorrhaging crews. B-17 and B-24 bombers are getting shredded over Germany. And the Army Air Forces needs every fighter group at Canfield. The Tuskegee Airmen have proven they can survive. Now they're going to get the chance to prove they can win. 
The 332nd Springs ships to Ramatelli Airfield in January 1944. And waiting for them on the flight line are rows of brand new P-47 Thunderbolts. The equipment excuse just evaporated. Ramatelli Airfield sits on Italy's Adriatic coast, a muddy expanse of pierced steel planking and canvas tents that becomes home. In January 1944, the 3032nd Fighter Group arrives, expecting P-47 Thunderbolts, and they get them for about two months. The P-47 is a beast, a seven-fighter with 850 caliber, machine guns, and enough armor to fly through a brick wall. The pilots love it, but the 15th Air Force has different plans. By late May 1944, the group transitions again, this time to the P-51, Mustang, and everything changes. The P-51 B and C models rolling onto. Ramatelli's flight line represent the cutting edge of American fighter technology. With a Packard-built Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, these aircraft cruise at 360 miles per hour and hit 440 at full throttle. Maximum range with drop tanks 900 meters. That means Berlin is suddenly within reach from Italian bases, and the 15th Air Force needs every long-range escort fighter it can muster. The strategic bombing campaign is burning through crews at an unsustainable rate. And somebody in muster, command has finally done the math. Dead bomber crews don't care what color their pan, escorts are. But here's the catch. The 3003 second isn't just getting Mustangs, they're getting a new mission. Fighter sweeps and ground attack are out. Bomber. Escort is in. This is the most politically sensitive job in the entire air war because it puts black pilots directly responsible for white lives. If bombers get shot down while the 3032nd is supposed to be protecting them, every racist in the Army Air Forces will have ammunition for decades. Colonel Davis gathers his squadron commanders and lays out the stakes in blunt terms. You will stay with the bombers. You will not chase glory kills and you will bring those crews home. The Mustangs arrive in, their standard olive drab and gray camouflage. But Davis orders something unprecedented. The entire tail assembly, painted bright red. The 99th had used red trim on their P-40S in North Africa. But this is different. These tails are fire engine red, visible from miles away, impossible to mistake for anyone else. The official reason is identification. Friendly bombers need to, one, know their escorts at a glance. The unstated reason is branding. If the 332nd is going to succeed or fail, everyone is going to know exactly who was flying escort. Those red tails become operational on June 7, 1944, during a mission to Munich. 68 P-51 seconds from the 30,032nd join a formation of B-17S from the 5th Bombardment Wing. And for the first time, bomber crews get a good look at their new escorts. The reaction is mixed. Some pilots are professionals who don't care about skin, color, as long as the fighters do their job. Others are Southerners who've never taken orders from a black man and certainly didn't expect to trust their lives to black pilots. The 332nd flies. Tight formation around the bombers closer than the P-47 groups typically fly. And the mission proceeds without. Incident. No bombers lost. No drama. Just a milk run that proves nothing. Except that the Red Tail Mustangs can handle basic escort duty. But inside the bomber crews, something is circulating. A rumor that won't die. The scuttlebutt says the 332nd has never lost a bomber to enemy fighters. It's not true yet, but the reputation is already forming. Part of this is timing. The Luftwaffe is getting bled white over Germany by summer 1944. Fuel shortages, pilot, losses, and dispersed manufacturing mean the Germans can't put up the 300 fighter. Swarms they fielded in 1943. The Red Tails are entering escort duty during a period when interception rates are dropping across the board. The skeptics in command are waiting for the 332nd to crack. They're watching loss reports counting bombers, and expecting the statistical anomaly to correct itself. Standard doctrine says fighter. 
Escorts should engage enemy aircraft aggressively, even if that means leaving the bombers temporarily exposed. The ponderous Cayman Cesard theory is that dead German fighters can't attack bombers. Every other fighter group follows this doctrine, because it's what the training manuals preach. Colonel Davis is about to throw that entire doctrine in the garbage. And the decision will define everything that comes after. The doctrine that's killing. American bomber crews in 1944 comes straight from the top, and it's built on fighter pilot ego more than tactical. Reality. The Army Air Forces teaches its fighter pilots that their primary mission is air superiority, shooting down enemy aircraft to establish control of the sky. Bomber escort is treated as a secondary duty. Almost an afterthought, the manuals explicitly encourage fighters to break formation and pursue enemy aircraft when opportunities arise. Kills equal promotions, medals, and glory. Staying with the bombers equals boring patrols that nobody writes home about. By March 1944, the numbers tell a brutal eighth. Air Force bombers flying out of England lose an average of 46 heavy bombers per 1,000 sorties. That's a 4.6% loss rate, which sounds manageable until you realize crews need to fly 25 missions to complete a tour. The math is savage. Statistically, your odds of surviving a full tour are roughly one in three. The 15th Air Force in Italy isn't much better. Their loss rates hover around 3.8%, 8%, which still means entire squadrons are getting replaced every few months. The Luftwaffe of has figured out the weakness in American tactics. German fighter commanders know the P-47 seconds and P-51 seconds will chase them if they present tempting targets. So they use small decoy formations, four or five, BF-109 seconds, flying provocatively near the bomber stream, waiting for the American escorts to take the bait. The moment the escorts break formation to pursue, larger German formations attack. 